big one. So, <laughs> teachings, I prefer to call them. But just some thoughts, different kind of a buffet for you to pick from this morning. But um, I read a quote this week that I've been kind of reflecting on a lot. And wasn't sure if I was going to share anything, but then Bonnie shared about you know, Jesus is Lord and we just there reign in our life. And you know, I started thinking about that. And the quote was, and I wish I remember the author of it, but the quote was basically, Jesus is either Lord over all or he is not Lord at all. And at first I kind of rebelled against that a little. I mean, he's always Lord. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, whether we recognize it or not. But I realized that what the author was talking about was a very personal and individual application of that. And as much as I didn't want to confront it, I realized there's a lot of truth in that. I was looking at my own life. Even if I give him lordship over 90% of my life, if I'm holding back 10, I'm still lord. Because I have the one now saying, well, I'll give that to you, but not this. He, I am not allowing him to be fully lord. Because he says, I want all of you, Eric. You know, Romans 12, present your lives as a living sacrifice. You know, uh, Paul and Galatians, it's no longer I who live, I've been crucified with Christ. It's now Christ who lives in me. And it's been something I've been sort of reflecting on this week and just kind of looking at my life. And I know there's areas of my life I absolutely hold back from God. I, I, I know that. I mean, I'd love to stand here and tell you I am a, you are looking at a 100% surrendered man of God. You know, he has entire lordship over every aspect of my life, but he doesn't. I, I, there's times, if I'm really honest, I know what I want to do during part of the day, and I don't really ask him if that's okay, or, you know, kind of, um, and really what I've done is I've kind of said, why don't you step off the throne for a while so I can sit back on the throne of my heart. And if I'm the one calling those shots, is he really Lord in my life at all? You know, if I'm picking and choosing when he is and when he isn't, am I not still the one in charge? You know, something to think about. And, and I hesitate to share it because I'm not, spoke, not trying to bring condemnation or shame or heads hung low as we walk out the door, but... You know, as I was praying earlier after the prayer request of praises, you know, I, I found myself praying, Lord, help us to see the vanity of holding on to anything. You know, and that's our, our verse of the month. You know, do not be deceived, brethren. Every good gift is from a God. For me to hold on to any part of my life and think I can produce something good, meaningful, purposeful, and without... God and His words who created me, who actually who made me. I would not exist were it not from God having made me for Him. And not to be a chess piece on a cosmic chessboard, but to have intimate relationship, to dwell within me and me and Him in relationship. You know, it, He is the very reason and essence of my being. And so there's such a futility of holding on to any part of my life. And yet it scares me sometimes to give it all to him. You know, it's kind of like, well, what if he doesn't want me to do what I really want to do? You know, and I think that's where you get the delight yourself in the Lord. and He will give you the desires of your heart, but the delight yourself in him first. When he is my greatest delight, then whatever I would do with him. You know, I've shared with you so many times, you know, Mary Ann and I, you know, so we got married and all, and she was in some women's quilt group, and I was like, well, I'll learn to quilt, just because I want to come. And I'm like, no, Eric, it's girls only. But, you know, or, or that neighbor who thought I was so awful making Marianne spring barbed wire fencing with me, and Marianne was like, you don't get it, she told her. I want to be with Eric. I, and we've always felt I would rather be doing something I don't enjoy with Marianne than doing something I really enjoy apart from Marianne. You know, there's no place on earth I could go visit that I would want to do alone, alone rather than be in my living room by the fire with a cup of coffee and Marianne. 
And, you know, when I delight in the Lord with all my heart, then whatever I'm doing with Him is better than anything I could do apart from Him. And so I'm just, it's a pondering, because multiple of our, our songs and Bonnie sharing, there's kind of this theme of the Lordship of God and the surrender to God and the filming and, you know, God is, He's a ferocious, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also very gentle. He's not going to rip that wall out of your heart. He's going to let you take the bricks down yourself. And every area that we partition off of him is an area of the spirit of God, the life of God will not flow. It's an area that's going to be sort of dead in us. Um, it may feel good, but in the end it will be seen for what it is. And so I share this not in condemnation, I share this as a partnership and a journey that I'm on as an invitation to say, Holy Spirit, where, where do I still hold on to the throne? And help me to see the futility and vanity of that, Lord, that I might fully be who you have made me to be. Because that's who I am made to be. I am made to be a man fully occupied by God. So you will never see who I am supposed to be truly what a man is supposed to look like because man was created to be filled by God. This is some Major Ian Thomas was sharing this in a teaching and it just really spoke to me. Anything short of a man or woman fully filled and occupied by God is a shell of who they're supposed to be. You know, his assumption that the, the townspeople of of Nazareth didn't recognize Jesus. Who is, you know, I mean, we know who, this is the guy we grew up with. This is, you know, what was happening when they're kind of like, is because they were seeing Jesus fully occupied. They'd never seen a man fully occupied by God before. And they're just like, what is this? And, you know, to fully represent the image of God, we're being transformed back to the image of God. To be fully the image of God, to so be fully occupied by God. Because everywhere I act from my flesh, everywhere I act from my own lordship, who are they seeing? They're seeing me. But everywhere I act, where Jesus is Lord of that action, and it is his life flowing through me, who are they seeing? Him. Why could Jesus say, I think it was to Philip, I forget who, but you know, show us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it says elsewhere in the New Testament, he's the express image of God. Wouldn't that be amazing to be able to say to those around us, if you see me, you get a glimpse of him? That's me. You know, wouldn't that be cool to be able to just say that without caveat? You know, oh, but don't watch me in that part of my life, or don't, you know, kind of. Um, and so I just, it's just an invitation. The second uh, thought I said, like I said, this is a buffet this morning, so now I'm totally separate. Um, something I shared with the youth on Thursday night, which is, is something I like, is we tend to consider in this culture, because we've made Thanksgiving a national holiday, we, we think of Thanksgiving often with a capital T, yeah. a proper noun, which it is. It's the whatever Thursday of every November, you know, and we get a day off of school. And I believe biblically we're supposed to consider it a verb. It's supposed to be the action and fragrance and mark of a Christian's life as a heart of the thankfulness. But it is thanksgiving. It is a verb. It is the giving of thanks. It is a continual heart that recognizes the goodness and favor of God in our life every day. From the very fact that I owe my essence, my very creation to Him, I owe every heartbeat and every breath to Him. I owe, remember our verse of the month again, do not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift, if it is good in your life, it is His hand and action in your life. You know, when we start to consider that, His salvation, all of that. Um, you know, I love Rich Linger's continual reminder when he's not here, Carolyn's, it's a beautiful day. You know, it is a beautiful morning. And... You know, just that whole so we take it for granted. Yeah. Rich, you continually, you are that fragrance in my life that continually reminds me to notice those little things. And it just, I value that so much. You know, and if we look around, I mean, every moment, every beautiful flower petal, I mean, we just, we pulled in 
to Children's Church, you know, parked by Children's Church this morning, and Marianne just looks and goes, look at those colors on the leaves. It was just one of those moments, you just go, wow. You know, yesterday, I think, or a day before, I must have run outside my camera three or four times every time I saw a cloud formation. It was just like, what am I ever going to do with these pictures? Nothing. I mean, really. I mean, but yet, for that moment, you're just, I want to capture this You are amazing. And I really believe, you know, we, we've, I, I love, Thanksgiving has possibly, because of the lack of commercialization of it, possibly become my favorite holiday of the year. I, 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 what Christmas and Easter represent, you can't beat it. But, but there's still a, a purity to Thanksgiving, I think. And... I, I love, I, I won't say there's nothing in it for me because I love the food, but and I love the time with family and just the day around the fire, but, you know, there's something, and, and so, so don't hear what I'm saying as saying Thanksgiving in November is bad. What I'm saying is let's as Christians be careful not to make that be the only time we, Thanksgiving is supposed to be the verb of our life. We enter his courts. We go through his gates with thanksgiving and praise. You know, what is the, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you? Is it rejoice, always pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks? This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, right? I mean, this is to be the mark of our life. This is what, what, what I was saying to you. What does thanksgiving do? It humbles me because if I'm giving thanks, I'm inherently giving thanks to something or someone saying this wasn't me. You know, I don't think any of us sit around going, you know, in my case, wow, thank you, Eric. You really blessed me yourself. You know, you really, no. What is Thanksgiving? It is the recognition of someone else's movement into my life. I'm not really sure what an atheist would do on Thanksgiving, honestly. If, 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 if I mean, I'm... Who are you giving thanks to? I mean, I guess you can be thankful, but to who? You know, for it's uh, if it's just cosmic chance. If it's you know, there's there's a heart to this, and so I just encourage you as we approach this day to cultivate a culture of thanksgiving in your heart. And to spread that to those around you. You know, I love this day that we, we narrow, you know, it's like that, it's like that, you know, everyone, I'm sure everyone in this room has taken at some point in their childhood a magnifying glass and let the sun's rays all get beamed and burn a piece of wood or something like that, you know. And, you know, you see that, and, and that's kind of what the holiday of Thanksgiving does. It just takes, but the reality is all those rays are coming down every day. Yeah. And... Yeah, yes, One Carol. thing that made me more cognizant of every little blessing in my life, the fact that I could get out of bed under my own steam this morning, take everything else throughout the day, was I read in a book once, what would happen if God started taking away from you everything you didn't tell him thank you for? I've heard that, yes. That's... that's Yes, yeah, scary. That's a good one. That's a powerful one. Thanks, yeah. Carolyn. And I, I hear you, Carolyn. I agree with it 100% in the, in the idea, not that I want him to take it away, but in the sense of a reminder of how much we have to be thankful for. And this does not diminish that many of you are going through really, really hard things. But in everything, there is always that place that cannot be taken from us. Our creation, our relationship with God, our security, our adoption, our salvation, His presence with us, His promise to work all things to good, not that all things are good, but His promise to work all things to good, all of that cannot be taken from us. They are covenantal promises from God who does not lie. And so it's just that's just another thought. And then last week, a uh, third thing I want to pick up on is the idea of faith. Because I want to, I want to clarify a few things, and I, I was 
as we were talking, I was talking about faith as the shut-off valve, the, the valve that we open that allows God's life to flow through us. And the example that I used is you got a 10,000-gallon water tank up there filled to the top with water. The pipes are all charged, and they come down to the house, and they hit that shut-off valve that's closed. And from that point forward, there's spigots and the house that's all plumbed and everything. There's empty pipes waiting to be filled. That's us apart from Christ. We are made, we have our, we're here, we're walking with that shell, with the hollow pipes, waiting to be filled with living water, the very life, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. But until we open that valve, we're just a shell of who we're supposed to be. Because we were created to have water flow. You know? Imagine you go to buy a house, right? And, and you go out there and you're so excited. It's like your dream house. And you turn on your spigot and nothing comes out. And you think, hmm. So you go to the shower and nothing comes out. And you go to the garden hose and nothing comes out. And you go to the realtor and go, where's the water? He goes, oh, there's no water. No, I mean, well, do you have a well? No. Are you hooked to city water? No. You collect rainwater. No. Okay. That's kind of who we are walking around without Christ's life in us. The awesome thing is, it's not like we have to do anything to fill the water tank in those pipes. It's already been done. God already paid on the cross. He, 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 he made the payment for our sin that every obstacle between us and God is taken care of. And his Holy Spirit, his living water, it's like an artesian well just bubbling up. It's filled the tank, it's filled the pipes, it's just pounding against that shutoff valve as the Holy Spirit relentlessly pursues us and woos us and chases us and cries out for us just saying, open, open. And our faith, see, see, we can sit in that house and believe all we want and know that that tank is full and those pipes all the way to that shutoff valve behind the house are full. But until we open the valve, it can't flow. That valve is our faith. That valve is we let God's life flow into us. We let Him live in us, fill us, move through us. And that's our faith. If you could bring up Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, please. So one of our verses of the month a few weeks, a few months back, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. I want to clarify this a little. I did it when we brought it up, and I didn't really know there was a need. But again, another thing that's been working on my heart lately, it's just kind of this clarification. We are not saved by faith. You say through faith. Okay. Faith itself doesn't save us. Faith allows the salvation to flow through us. It, it, and there is a difference here. If my faith saved me, my faith, then I have a reason to boast. I've got tons of faith. I've got more faith than you've got. You know, whatever. Everything's been done. Jesus did it all. He died on the cross. He paid a price. His indwelling Holy Spirit stands ready. And the gift He gives that He offers everyone is the faith to let it flow. But some people say no. Even me on my own would not have faith were God not to woo me and draw me and make it possible. My unregenerate dark self has nothing. And, and I'm not trying to get into the whole predestination versus free will, Arminianism, you know. Has he given that to everyone or just some people, the elect, the chosen, you know, whatever. God desires that none should perish. It is my belief firmly that he offers the faith to turn that handle to every person. That he gifts to us, to every man, woman, and child, what we need to open the door. But we suppress that truth, we bury it because we love darkness. We love to live on our own, unaccountable to God, more than we love to live in the light. 
which is the life of God in us. That is my will. If there is, I know there's a lot of verses about predestined and chosen. I believe an answer to those verses, because there's equal number about free will and every person. My answer would be that God has not said, I'm going to create this one just to go to hell. I believe God knows already who will make that choice and who won't. I believe he's seen that. But I firmly believe that every person is given the gift, the faith, to make the choice for salvation. And what do I do when I make that choice? I say, come on in. I receive what you have done. I receive your life. I receive your payment. I receive your salvation. Fill me. Flow into me. Occupy me. And then flow out of me. This I love the picture of an artesian well that just boils up from underground, just keeps coming and coming and flowing out. And if you don't cap it, it just keeps flowing and you know everything. And what do we do? We tend to cap the Holy Spirit. We tend to quench and grieve. We tend to say, "No, Lord, you know, I, I, I'm not. I don't want to go talk to that person. I don't want to give that. I don't want to do that." And and maybe a better example of I haven't thought of it, but maybe a better example than walling off rooms in our heart is turning off spigots. You know, when God wants the kitchen sink wide open and the shower wide open and the garden hose wide open, and He wants just, because He's our teacher, and He's boundless and limitless, His life, the bubble flows through those pipes, which is us, the house, which is us. You know, He wants it just to keep flowing out. Be the light of the world, be the salt of the earth, be the fragrance of Christ unto the dying world. You know, just let it flow. Get My life is boundless. You cannot drain my tank. You know, when he's flowing, but I tend to close that one because now I'm really not that mood today and close that one and this one. And then next thing I know, I'm kind of this stuffed up house with all the spigots closed. And Yeah, he's in me. I'm saved. But it's just, it's not flowing. And my faith, Let's. I, the Major Ian Thomas, he said, the simplest definition of faith is faith of lets. It lets God do what God's going to do. Faith says yes. You know, even the demons believe and tremble. But faith says okay. You know. You know I was telling Mary, I was reading this morning the story of the prodigal son. And, you know, he could have sat in that field with the pig's food and believe with all his heart, if I was just back at daddy's house, man, even as just a servant, at least I'd have a place to sleep and food to eat. But until he got up and walked towards dad, until he started to walk towards the road, and the beautiful picture is, you know, he gets to the father's distant view just starting up the dirt road, and dad just goes, this dignified Jewish, you know, father that never is stoic, just, throws his arms around the sun, weeping tears, covers him with his coat. My son is home. And he gives him his basket, the fatted calf, my best robe. He just covers him. The tiny faith of that son was met by the immeasurable blessing and outflow of the father. You know, it, it, the father's response to the son was so out of proportion to just that tiny step of faith. They didn't just believe things would be better, but stepped in that direction. And it's a beautiful picture. And so those are a few things I kind of wanted to touch on, clarify. And then, you know, last week we, we talked a little more. If you can bring the verse of the month up, please. It's an image. A little bit more about the verse that we're paying attention to this week. James 1, this month, 16, 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And as I've said, I see this verse as being an amazing verse to study this month for two reasons. One, it's a guardrail. It's a reminder. Don't even try. It's, it's futility. It's vanity to try and find goodness, meaning, and purpose apart from God. Every good and perfect gift is from Him. And I'm not going to find it outside of him. I'm not going to find it in a life, no matter how well-intentioned, on my own. 
apart from his life, his leading, his breath, his words, me. And the second, man, if I start to grasp this, like Carolyn said, if I start to recognize, you know, man, how can we not be a people of thankfulness, even in the midst of really hard times? And it's, so those were two things we kind of talked about. We talked about how goodness has to have some foundation or source. Moral relativism is just an untenable position, but yet it is held by an increasingly scary percentage of our society. They may not call it that, but this whatever's right for you is right for you. Whatever choices you want to make are okay for you. No, it's not. Because we will each stand before a creator one day who made us, who has every right to us. We would not exist were it for him. And there's some things he said are true and some are false and some are right and some are wrong and some are okay and some are not. And love says you need to hear that. It's not me saying it's right or wrong, true or false, good or bad. I'm, I'm just sharing with you what God has said. And, and it's not, there are some things and we have to have some foundation. And so we talked about that last week. And then we closed off in our series that we're actually, the big one we're in, um, the biblical promises of God, those things that we can be assured of, not just hope are true, but know are true, because God said, for Christians, we have a book filled with things about God and things that God has told us and promises from God that, that we can know are true. The world hopes things are true. The world hopes for certain things, and there are certain things we hope for. Um, you know, but there's many things we don't need to hope we can know, and even though we may not hold them or tangibly touch them or see them because God has promised them or told them to us, and as Abraham and Sarah, we count him faithful who has promised to you who cannot lie, we can know with the full assurance of our heart these things are true. We've looked at God's love for us, our security in God, God's presence with us. And so last week we wrapped up the promise we can know that God loves us, and we we spent weeks looking at the nature of that love. It's an amazing and awesome love. And a love of adoption and security and an endearment to our Father in heaven and, and heirs with Christ. A uh, love that keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And so we ended with, so what? You know, how do we walk out that door different because of this truth that we can know even when the enemy whispers you're unlovable, God couldn't love you. You messed up too badly this week. No one can love you through that. When the enemy whispers these things, you know, we can say, no, that is not true. And so how should we be different? Real quickly, we said, I can know all his intentions for me are good because he loves me. I have worth and value. I do not, I can be at peace. I do not need to be anxious or afraid. His love casts out fear. It drives fear away when I truly understand the creator of the universe loves me like crazy and is with me and I'm secure in that. It can't be taken from me. All these promises we've already looked at, you see how they just all dovetail. You know, his love for me would be okay, but if I'm not sure I'm secure in that love and that he's with me to act in that love, then that's not necessarily the most secure thing. But when I know he loves me and he's with me, and I'm secure in that love, you start to see how these come together. I, like I said before, if I know he's with me and I'm secure in his presence, but I'm not confident he loves me, then that's not very secure. You know, it all goes together. Um, he looks for my good, not my bad. He's not a father that's sitting there waiting for me to screw up and look and go, ha! He's a father that said, I saw every screw up you were ever going to make before I ever gave you life, and I already carried it on. Now let's pick up our head and get back into your destiny. Let's get back into the life I've created you to live. You are amazing. You're made in my image. You're my child. I have plans for you. I love you. And I will walk with you through those plans I've made for you. Let's go. We've got a battle to fight. You know, we got a kingdom. I can be secure. I can trust him. And the last thing that we talked about that should make us different is when I am secure in his love and recognizing how he has loved me in my most unlovable bits, I find, at least in me, and I think it's biblical, I find a much greater capacity to love others through their unlovableness, their wounds, and other things. 
Now, what that love looks like, you know, it doesn't mean you invite that person into your home for a meal necessarily or become best buds. And certainly forgiveness does not mean you say what they've done is okay or anything, but it actually frees you to be who God's called you to be. And so those are kind of what we did. And this morning, for the next just few minutes, I'm going to introduce the next promise we are going to look at. And then, God willing, next week we'll really begin to unpack this. Uh, please bring up James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I don't know about you, but that is a very encouraging promise to me. We'll talk about the first half of it as the conditions that God has given. Remember conditions? You know, that, that mug I put up on the wall last week, that the image, the meme of the mug, I can do all things through a verse out of taken out of context. Uh-huh. You know, we want to run around sometimes and go resist the devil and he will flee. God promised, but we forget the first half. Submit themselves, therefore, to God. You know, it's kind of like, God says he'll give me the desires of my heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, that he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, there's, and so we're going to go back and unpack that first half. But, but first, just look at this promise, provided we meet the conditions and context. How encouraging it is to walk out there and to know that God has promised that we resist the devil, he will. Imagine the confidence you can walk into these encounters with if you truly believe that promise. And it comes from he who cannot lie, your creator. You know, imagine if you were going to go into a boxing ring and someone who saw the future told you you're going to win. You know, or some conflict, you're going to win. Fight back and you will win. I promise you, and this is a person who you know you can trust, who has some magical way to already know the future. You would enter that situation with so much more confidence, whether a confrontation with a boss or whatever it's going to be. God tells you, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Wow. Funny. I have a pastor friend who loves to know the end score of a game, especially a real tight game, because all the time he's watching it and they're failing, he's going, come on, come on, you're going to win, you're going to make it, keep going. Bill <laughs> <laughs> John. Yeah, I, I, I get that sometimes. I always have to, before I start a novel, and Janice Gilbert to just cover your ears, I have to go to the back to make sure the guy gets the girl. I don't want to read for six or eight hours of in sad, you know. I have to know it ends happy. If you ever recommend the movie to me, I will say, will I be happy at the end or will I cry? Because I will not spend two hours watching something where I'm going to feel bad at the end. Real life has too much pain. If I'm watching a movie or reading a book, I'm trying to get out of that. I don't need it in my entertainment. So just be forewarned. But I get that. Yeah, you know the end. Here's the end. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I think as Christians, probably our, our great fault here is we do not take seriously enough the spiritual war we are in. And it is something the Bible has gone out of its way from the first chapters of Genesis to let us know that we have a real adversary. This is not a game. And it is not a joke. We have a very real adversary who hates anything and everything that is good because if it's good, it's from God. He hates your guts. Well, I hate you too. There you go, okay. (laughs) I am not one, you know, to look for a demon under every rock, as they say. You know, man, I'm, I'm out of water here devil drain my bottle, uh, you know, or something. I'm not, but I am, I am savvy enough to have read the New Testament enough to recognize there's a whole lot of chance that in many things going on around me that I may not give credit for, 
there is a demonic influence or at work. I mean, we know, J Jesus said, Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He has zero good intentions. He repeatedly encountered demonic forces battling illnesses, sicknesses, mental issues. Um, I mean, you th I, I've said so many times, you think about the man in the tombs of the Gadarenes who kept breaking his chains and tearing his clothes and running around naked and living out there and the villagers were terrified of him. And Jesus, you know, showed up. And, and what would we do today, probably, in a secular thing? We would counsel and medicate this person into oblivion. And Jesus knew what he needed was just a good old deliverance. And he cast those demons out. This man is set right and free. And he goes back to the village witnessing the joy and the freedom of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that is the case in everything, though. This is where you've got to be careful. There's absolutely hormonal imbalances. There's absolutely significant things. But I'm saying that if we do not recognize that this spiritual battle and war that we are in is real, we're going to miss the enemy many, many times. And you're walking around your house, there's just tension, there's just stuff going on, things, whatever, whatever. There is a chance that there is a spiritual attack going on and, and what you really need is to stand in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came in the flesh, who died on the cross, was put in a tomb and on the third day rose and said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth, go therefore, and stand in that name and rebuke the spiritual forces that are bringing this darkness and tension into your home. Is that always the case? No. But to neglect that it might be, I think, is to our folly. And Paul says we should not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. And so starting next week, we're going to look at the background to the spiritual war we are in, and then we're going to begin to look, unpack this going back to verse 1. If you already want to read ahead, I would read James 4, 1 through 10, and start to look at the fullness of the conditions that surround this promise. But they are amazing. And then we'll talk about what is authority. What does it mean to walk in Christ's authority in this world? And it definitely, I'll tell you right now, it definitely has a component of being submitted to the authority of Christ yourself. We have delegated authority when we ourselves are submitted to authority. And so we're going to talk about, you know, God really, that's my plan next week. God could write a different script. But that's where I would like to go next Sunday. Uh, look at that. And um, just go from there. But here is your next promise that you as a Christian can know and not just hope. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And this is one of those promises that I hope is so equipping and encouraging to you as we start to unpack it in the coming weeks. So I'm going to pray and then um, as soon as Mary Ann is in from Children's Church and has her laptop set up to take minutes and stuff, I'm just going to circle some chairs and we're going to start our annual family meeting forever who would be a part of that. Like I said, I will have it done by 12.15 or earlier. We'll present our proposed 2024 budget, talk to you kind of where the church is at, talk about a little different ministry, just get ideas, throw things around. It might only you know, last less than that time too. It depends. I'd love for you to stay. If you can't, I get it. You don't need to tell me why. I totally understand. If you are staying and you're not a part of the meeting, but you're kind of hanging out, I ask that you just maybe talk outside or keep the voices down in the back once we've started the meeting. Um, but that's kind of what we're going to do. Don't forget, these pumpkins on the pew up here are all for grabs. And then, uh, you know, next Sunday, most of the rest of the squash and pumpkins will also all be available. We want to take some pumpkins? pumpkins. Oh, they were given to us by Larry Santos. That's oh, very nice, Tom. Thank you very much. We'll do that. So... Father God, I thank you for this, this time. I thank you for your words, your truths, your, your incredible promises, Father. I love you, Father. I ask that you bless this day. I ask that you bless this week ahead. You would fill our hearts with thankfulness and show us the role we play in counting our blessings and cultivating thanksgiving as a verb in our life, as a season and fragrance of our life, a people of thankfulness. I ask, Father God, that you bless this meeting, that you would anoint and lead us, Holy Spirit, to your decisions. If there's anything we're considering adopting that isn't in your heart, that you would make it clear. If there's anything we've not even thought of, that you would also bring that to us, Lord, that you would give us wisdom.
I thank you for this fellowship. I thank you that we even have a fellowship, that we even have resources, we even have a building. I thank you, Lord. Um, what a privilege. Um, just bless this, this fellowship, this family, Father. Let your glory fall. Let us your Holy Spirit to flow. That this would be the most amazing Thanksgiving, no matter what circumstance we are in, that we would feel closer to you, more thankful to you, and more alive in you this Thanksgiving week than we have ever felt. And it would just grow and grow, not a flash in the pan, but just grow and grow that we would cultivate this joy in our heart and trust the faith that opens the mouth and says, come, flow, fill, live. Thank you, Father. I ask this in Jesus' name.